so good to see that Africans are investing in Africa. I mean, it feels so good to see Africans from different African countries investing in other African countries. Don't tell me something like this is not beautiful. My brother, my sister, the revolution is happening. It's time for a borderless Africa. It's time for each and every African out there to know that Africa belongs to Africans. Don't be scared in investing in another African country. It's your favorite village boy, Mr. Ghana, baby. And I'm here in Port Harcourt, Nigeria to share an inspiring video that will make you go out of your comfort zone to also go out there and invest in another African country. The story I'm gonna to share today is about a Gambian man who moved from Gambia, came to Nigeria to build this biggest estate in Port Harcourt that you see on your screen. You know what you need to do for me? Like the video, subscribe and be part of the 700,000 YouTube subscribers and you know what? I'm not gonna talk too much. Come with me and get inspired. Aya Maya. Mr. Mustafa, the yeah. Gambian that is making a huge impact in Nigeria. I mean, you're coming from a country with two million people and you're making a change in a country of over 200 million people. My brother, how did you do it? Well, thank you, I mean, um, uh... I would say destiny, destiny brought me here, but I, I came out searching for opportunities. Searching for opportunities, and if you're searching for opportunities in Africa, Nigeria is the place to be, because Nigeria has a population of 200 million. You know, and since I can compete, you know, I can compete, I'm, I'm African, I'm human, I've got the capacity. Um, if I want to expand in Africa, there's no place to be than, than Nigeria. Nigeria is one of the countries that people from other countries don't want to hear. And you left Gambia to come and settle in here, which I think it's really incredible. I mean, so many of them watching us don't know your real name. My name is Wadamaya from Ghana. Um, what is your name? And I know you're from Gambia. But yeah. What is your name? Full name. My, my name is Mustafa Njai. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but everybody calls me Taf, like my company's name. Taf is short for Mustafa. Oh. So everybody calls me Taf. You know, so um, I am from the Gambia. Um, I am 63 years old. I don't look as <laughs> as old as I am. That's why I, I left this out here. Yeah, so we can make a difference. Yours is black, mine is gray. <laughs> you know, but I've been doing this for, for, for 31 years now. My business has been on for the past 31 years. We started our business in 1990. 1990. Yeah, but I left school, I left high school and I started working as a carpenter. And so for, for the past 45 years, I've been working in construction and, and technical related areas. No, let's get this clear. Yeah. You were a high school graduate. Yes. And then from there you became In 1975, yeah. And you became you know, a you know I, I, I had a passion for anything technical, working with my hands. You know, so at high school, I mean, I was very good in, in carpentry, in metal work, in technical drawing. And I just followed my passion. Did you go to university? No, I didn't. Straight from high school, actually, when I finished high school, which was one of the biggest high schools in the Gambia those days, 1975. Where were you in 75? No, I was not born. You were not born <laughs> yet. So, you know, so in 1975, you know, I left high school with my O levels. Whoa. So rather than pursuing my higher education, you know, it, I think it was also destined that, you know, I, I, am, I will be who I am today through this. But I followed my passion. I was in love with just working, you know, with my hands. So I thought actually at, at, the, at the school, I was a junior teacher and then later I moved on to a technical training center as a junior instructor. Hmm. Then later I worked with an international firm, you know, and that's really where my construction career started. I was employed as an engineer's assistant and I was just willing to learn anything to do with building construction. So I went up the ladder, you know, from one thing to the other, being trained by highly qualified prof uh, professionals. So I did it for about 15 good years. So apprenticeship is key, you know? So these days, young people like yourselves, you know, you want to run before you can crawl. So, you know, I did 15 years of working with others before I started my own business. So, so like, all the mistakes I was supposed to do in business- Was within the 15 years. Was within the 15 years. So then when I started in 1990, I just shot up like a rocket. I can't believe what is going on. I mean, you represent from grass to gray story. 
Yeah, from modest backgrounds, like most success stories, you know, I come from a very modest background, you know, family, you know, education, um, um, in a country that is also very small, the smallest in Africa, one of the smallest in Africa. Have you ever done any projects in the Gambia? Oh, yes. I mean, we, we are actually the pioneer of private real estate development in the Gambia. We started it. Tough Africa Global was those days called Tough Construction. And then we migrated to Tough Holding Company. Then I diversified. I used to own a hotel. I did building uh, material supplies. I did plant hire. And then finally, I came into real estate development. And the reason why I did real estate de development, the story is all the same. My, my client base was mainly diasporans, people living in the diaspora. Because, you know, every African who's out there in the diaspora in the West, they're dying to get a home back in their country. country. And the story is the same. They used to send monies to their families, their friends, and they will never build a house. Build a house. So I thought, look, there is a market, it's a captive market, where you know, you've got these Africans who can afford to build a house, but they don't have the serious developers to build it. So I just started with some few, and then I expanded, and have now doing really mass development. Anything that's under 1,000, I'm not interested. Because my vision over the next 20 years is to develop 1 million homes across sub-Saharan Africa. And that's why we're in Nigeria. Nigeria has a deficit you know, of over, nowadays I'm sure it's close to 20 million. When I was here eight years ago, I was told that it's 17 million deficit. And that's eight years ago. The African population is growing at an average of about 3%. Exactly. And they have, the supply has not been there. So obviously, you know, now there's a deficit just in Nigeria alone, over 20 million homes. So people like us, that's what we see as an opportunity. And we're here to partner with the right partners and mainly one government. In doing this, we need to partner with government. Okay. We need to partner with the financial institutions, okay. the banks, so that they can finance the projects. And then, you know, in Nigeria, remember, there are 36 governments here, apart from, from federal. federal. There's 36 states. Exactly. So I call this the elephant of Africa. If you're looking for meat, you're going hunting, Good this is Nigeria. the place to be. You came here eight years ago, and the project that you've done is incredible. When I got here, I was blown away. Like, I can't believe that something like this actually exists in here. And it's not even for a Nigerian, but a Gambian. There should be one phrase or one code that keeps you moving because what you've done is something that I think the whole Africa needs to come and see. That's why I'm here. Yeah. What is that one favorite quote that keeps you moving? Well, you know, my, my role model, my role model is Nelson Mandela. I look up to him for a lot of things. I think every African should look up to Nelson Mandela. One, patience, you know, vision, you know, and, and also uh, tolerance. So these are the things that drives me. Hmm. And Nelson Mandela says one thing, that it always seems impossible until it's done. So when we came here, very few people believed in us. They thought, oh, no, no, that's another, you know, fly by night or a 419, as we say in, in Nigeria. Nigeria. Oh, he's a scammer. You know, he's saying, no, he doesn't need any money. All he needs is just the land. Oh, give him the land, let him see. And actually, even the land that they was, I was given was all muddy. It's, you know, this is River State. River State, there's no land. So we had to sand field 650,000 cubic meters of sand to be able to, where you are now, mm -hmm. This was all water. At high tide, it will be two meter high, two meter deep of water. So we had to sand fill it. You know, from the river, we pump it. At times, about two kilometers away, we'll get a dredger and dredge and fill it up, compact it. So real engineering really happened here. So it was always impossible. Some people thought, oh, this man must be crazy. So it's never impossible until it's done. So now it's done. Everybody say, yes, it's possible. No, is so that's one quote that I want every African to remember. And it was said by Nelson Mandela, who is the uh, father of not only the African, but any African, of anybody of African descent. Mandela says that it always seems impossible until it's done. This is incredible. You, you mean like where we are walking right now used to be mud? Yes, it's mud and it was filled with water. At high tide, you will have an average about two meters of water at high tide. So we used to walk here, there was a pipe, 
you know, about almost um, uh, close to a kilometer long, mm. that we had to walk on the pipe to get to the other end. So all this was sand filled. Where we're standing now, you couldn't walk like this. It was all mangroves and then it was mud and also water. Two how, meters deep. How many hectares is this right now? Well, this, 40 hectares. 40 hectares. The whole estate is 40 hectares of land. You've been here for eight years. Yes. And how many houses have you done so far? We've built over a thousand houses. Over a thousand. We have the apartments which are about 600 and something hectares. 600 and something units. You know, then we have townhouses, we have villas. You know, in total, when everything is ready, it's over a thousand, about a thousand one hundred and so on. So which means you're still building? Yeah, we're still building, we're building, we're building. We're still building. We've, we've sold out, but we're still building. You know, before I want to know your first ever project that you built in here, did you ever live abroad? No, never. Meaning abroad like as in... You, as in you stayed abroad to make all your money before coming back? No, no, no. I was born, raised and bred in the Gambia. You know, I am a made in Gambia product. I'm an African product. Everything I, I know, everything I have, everything I've made in my life, I made it in Africa. And why are we saying, Africans are saying that it's not possible on the continent? Well, it's because probably a lot of reasons. One, the right policies are not in place to encourage Africans, you know, to, to develop themselves and then to exploit opportunities. Um, I'll give you a good example. Mm. Things like uh, investor. Investor is synonymous to Western or somebody outside of Africa, not, not our color, color, not the black man. So, and I've heard that very often. People ask me, oh, who are your partners? You know, I don't need a partner. I can do probably what anybody can do who is of a different race. But in Africa today, anything big like this that you want to do, they yeah, think that it's done by somebody, as we call in Nigeria, Oibo, meaning a white guy or a Chinese. And if you look at Africa today, we need to be very careful, yeah. you know, because the African continental free trade area is on. Mm. It started 1st of January. Exactly. And it's, you're going to have a population of 1 billion people. It is the biggest economy in the world. But what have we seen recently? We have seen all the big players, all the first, you know, the big players, like mm. big, com big countries, are now forging partnership with Africa. You know, Africa-China initiative, Africa-US, Africa-British, Africa Africa-Europe. Africa that is to get now Africa, you know, these guys still coming in and, you know, controlling our economy. It is high time that as Africans, we take ownership. And we hope that the African continental free trade area will empower Africans, you know, to take over the economy of Africa. And it can be done. What, what, what will happen if Africans take ownership of what they have? What do you think will happen? Well, you know, it will, it will do a lot of things. It will uh, eradicate poverty because Africa is seen as the, as the biggest, uh, the poorest con continent in, in, in the world. So if you empower Africans, they will create wealth. Uh, they will reduce unemployment. We see quite a lot of youth migration, you know, leaving Africa, going through the Sahara Desert, you know, going through the oceans, you know, into, the, into Europe. What, for greener pastures. So why are, we, why, are we, why are we getting all these things happening? It is because we haven't empowered Africans. And really what happens most of the time is that there is not the political will. We need to get our politicians to be committed in things like this, to make sure that Africans are empowered, you know, like African entrepreneurs to take over businesses. Mm. So employment is created, wealth is created, and then poverty is eradicated. This is the first project I've done outside of the Gambia, big project, and uh, it's in River State, in Port Harcourt, which is called the Garden City, you know, this is the Garden City. Yeah, and, I, I, you know what, let, let me ask you, of all the places in Nigeria, why Port Harcourt? Destiny brought me here. Hey, you keep on saying I was, destiny, I was destined destiny. to be here. But, but, but the problem is that, look, there was an opportunity. Because then in Port Harcourt, there was nothing like this. And remember in Port Harcourt, all the oil and gas companies are here. Hmm. This is where the, the treasury of, of Nigeria is. This is where the wealth is. This is where the oil center is. So you have all the oil and gas companies. And obviously they need decent accommodation. So, and it wasn't here. So accommodation for these expatriates mm. and Nigerians, you know, were very expensive. So I identified the need, there was a need for it. Then I took the risk, everybody said, oh, it's too risky, don't come here, you know, kidnapping everything. But where there's no risk, there's no returns. 
So I took the risk and obviously did have a partnership with the River State government. Okay. And that was how this was born. You built an affordable home. Because this is, uh, I feel like this has the quality and also very affordable. But I just want to know, you being from Gambia, who are the people who actually built this? Well, it was built by Africans. It was a mixture of Nigerians mm -hmm. and also other African countries. Because I, I, I live in Gambia and also I've done work in Senegal, and those, we have very good artisans that I had to bring in. Okay. I ferried four, 400, 400 Gambians and Senegalese across the border from Senegal and Gambia all the way overland to here. But apart from that, what we did was we trained the community. You know, because the community also, as you know, they have, there are people who were unemployed, mm. you know, young people. Mm. We trained them. And today I have some of those contractors that I trained here who are working now in my projects in Gambia. From, from, from Port here, Harcourt? from Port Harcourt, they are now, now working, working in, Gambia. in Gambia. Yeah, actually 90% of my technical staff in the Gambia are Nigerians. My project manager, my engineers, my quantity surveyors, my managers. You know, because look, we are an African outfit. We don't see borders. And I think that's what the ACFTA is all about. Papa. That Africa without borders. So any African that is qualified, that can add value to what we are doing, mm. we will take you on board. That's amazing. Yes. Mr. Mustafa, I just want to know what makes this Gulf Estate unique? The Rift of Gulf Estate is very unique. One, it's very well secured. So you have over a thousand families living, you know, within a fenced property. And it's all very well secured. So you can leave your kids to play around, you know, and uh, they, nobody, you know, they will, they will have any security risk. Mm. That's one. Um, uh, utilities, you know, in Nigeria, utilities is an issue. Exactly. Electricity, water supply, sewage, it's all, um, it's all serv serviced. So um, uh, 24 hours power, 24 hours water supply, 24 hours sewage. So that makes it very unique. And also it's affordable. It's affordable for yeah. everyone. Yes. So we have how many phases now? We've got two phases. We've got the first and the second phase, and we are at the final end of just finishing the second phase. And the final end of the second phase is going to be what? Well, it's mainly villas and the golf course. That's okay. where the golf course is, and there's a golf, there's a golf club house there. And we hope that by middle of this year, it should all be ready. Mr. Mustafa, now I want to ask you questions concerning Africa and Africans. Yes. You know, you're from Gambia. Yeah. You came to invest in Nigeria. Yeah. Do you think that it's worth it for Africans to invest in other African countries, not just their own countries? Yes, of course. You know, investment, there shouldn't be any barrier to investments. Because investments, you look at returns. Okay. So we should, as Africans, we should look at where opportunities are. Okay. And wherever there are opportunities, you know, obviously you mitigate your risk, you calculate your risk, and you should invest there. And this all you do by doing the right studies, doing the right due diligence. And you know, from my experience, having invested in Nigeria for eight years, mm. you know, I think Africans should look out, you know, for countries beyond where their origin is. And wherever you feel that you can add value, you can obviously make good returns, you should head out there. Because Africa should be boundaryless or borderless. Do you think Africa is the future? It is already here. We're not talking about the future anymore because the African continental free trade area, it's in. It's on already from January 1st. It's, it's so so, so tariff, tariff barriers are going to be removed. You know, some tariffs are going to be removed. So if you manufacture or do something in one of the countries, you can move it to others. So it is, we're not talking about the future, we're talking about now. So Africans should get up and take ownership. Let's not wait for others to come and exploit all these opportunities. If you had one thing to change about Africa, what would it be? Leadership. How? Every, every leadership within our lives, we need to look at it. Political leadership, religious, society, social, you know, uh, business. The thing that is bringing Africa down is poor leadership. If our leaders do the right thing, then Africa will shoot up. So if there's one thing that we need to address, we need to address leadership. How do we address leadership? By making sure that we train them with the right values. We need to start from a very young age, getting young kids, you know, trained with the right values hmm. so that they will do away with corruption. Corruption is killing Africa. And we're thinking that it's part of our life to be corrupt. That even if you're not corrupt, they think that you are not really African. 
You know, so that should stop. And we should work on now creating future leaders by, by making sure that the good values of leadership is inculcated in their brains. They grow with it. They are disciplined. For example, like for in Singapore, what do you see in Singapore? Lin Kuan Yew, you know, started around the same time that African president started. But he changed Singapore today. The reason is because there is discipline. You know, those who are in front are, are trained to have the right lead, uh, leadership values. Singapore did not use democracy. Do you think Africa needs democracy? That's another debate. I don't go into politics. <laughs> I am an entrepreneur. That's another debate for me. Whether democracy or not democracy. democracy. We do I, our business. Yes, I do my business. And my, I, all I am saying is that, look, we, there are values in leadership. Yes, yes. Some few values. For example, you should be disciplined. You should be honest. You should be hardworking. You know, you should have maybe a man of integrity. Exactly. You know, so just to name these four, some of our leaders today don't have this. Today it's one, tomorrow it's the other. Or today you are green, the next day you are yellow. You know, you must believe in something. You must, you know, have confidence in yourself. Mm. You know, so there are really core values of leadership that every leader should have. And that is what is missing with, in African leaders. We have so many Africans watching us right now. If you have a message to all Africans, both Africans in the diaspora and Africans living in Africa, what would that message be? Well, my message is that, look, there's no shortcut to success. There are two things that you must do to be successful. You must be able to, hard, to work hard and be honest. This is the formula to success. So every African, especially you, the young ones, should bear this thing in mind. Because I get this question quite often. You know, young people walk up to me. Oh, Uncle Mustafa or Mr. Mustafa, I want to be like you. Can I share your story? I mean, it was hard work. It doesn't happen overnight. You young African starts a business, the next thing is he's a CEO. My friend, you cannot start being a CEO. You have to start from the bottom of the ladder and then build yourself up. You need to go through an apprenticeship and you must be honest. You know, we must be honest in everything you do, your relationship at the family level, society, you know, business, you know, politics. We must inculcate in honesty in African society. I just want to say thank you so much for talking to me. I appreciate your time, but it's not going to be the last time I'm seeing you because I get to know that you have a lot to share. You're from Gambia. You've done a project in Gambia. So I think I'll see you in Gambia. See you in Gambia. Actually, in Gambia, we have, as I told you, we have a vision to develop one million homes mm -hmm. over the next uh, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And Gambia is our base. You know, we're going to build, you know, the biggest free zone within an airport in the whole of West Africa. 160 hectares of a free zone in Gambia. in the Gambia and we are building our biggest estate which really is my retirement project which is called the Pearl Gardens hey, you know we're going to we're going to build it's over 300 hectares of land and this time we're bring, bringing agriculture into our estates yeah. so everything that people eat should, con should, be, should be grown within our estate you retire at the age of what? at the age of 90 <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this amazing episode. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Hey, we need to reach 700,000. I mean, this video should get a million views. You don't think so? But then you will pay me that. <laughs> <laughs> we have to share now. That's the bit. No, you know, I'm very Nigerian know. now. <laughs> In Nigeria, there's no free lunch. Everything you have to settle. So please, Maya, yeah. you have to settle me. You know, like, Let's agree. Everybody's agree. watching. Okay, everybody please watching. subscribe to this video. And Thank remember, you. when we hit a million, million I'm going to share with Maya. Huh? Uh, you know, so subscribe to this video. This video is full of inspiration. That's what I'm saying that every African out there need to get a piece of this video. Do me a favor. Be part of it. Share this video to friends and family. I help Maya. Peace out. That was a good video. Thank you. <laughs>